scary, right? Do we can have ASF here, but actually there are more labs that are given permission to work on ASF at various levels. Um, and in fact, it would be a pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Hip Vu. His lab has also been given the, the um, opportunity to work on ASF and not just um, Palm Island or, or um, uh, Kansas uh, for, for, for ASF research. Um, so I'm going to leave it to him to introduce his, his project. Um, and I'm sure you'll see it's, it's a very interesting um, idea of how to look at ASF. Uh, both in the field and um, in developing new, new tools to combat this. Thank you, Dr. Lin. Um, so, just relating to your question, basically ASF is one of the um, agents that is very hard to work with because it's very complex. Right? The biology is complex, but the regulation is complex as well because it is a select agent. So when you work with ASF, not just like select, inter I mean, not just secure in terms of like the biological sample, but also the data, meaning that where you store them, who gonna get access to them. And so the complexity making making it difficult to, to study and I would not study ASF until uh, 2019 because I there's no way I can do anything with them. And then on my trip to Vietnam together with the dean and my colleague and the governor when they go for trade mission. And then I realized that in Vietnam I have some collaborators, they have the facility, they have the resources that I am able to work with them. So all of my work presented today are done in collaboration with Vietnam. I do not have anything in my lab until this year. So it took me quite a long time to get the permit to bring the virus to the facility. So with that, all of the credit go to the people in Vietnam who does the work for me. So a quick introduction. Um, this is my group. It's me. I have um, five PhD students right now. Um, the lab is at the Nebraska Center of Virology, and we have about like 12 different labs, uh, all dedicated to viruses, and we study human, plant, and animal viruses. So my lab, I work on three different viruses. Uh, actually, I was trained on POST. I did my master and PhD on POST, and then I started to work on influenza virus. And like I said, until 2019, I started working with the ISF because the opportunity to collaborate with the people in Vietnam. So I know, I just put it here, just to say one thing, the ASF is the virus that you really need a good vaccine, you really need a good diagnostic test, but you do not want to use them, okay? You just hope that you never have to use them because you don't want to see it. Um, this is all. So for today's presentation, I have um, kind of two parts. The first part is to evaluate the performance of the like, quick test, the pen side test. Um, and this one is funded by the Swipe Health Information Project in 2020. So here I have two different tests to show. One is the portable PCR. So this is really like a real-time PCR, but it's run on battery. And you can bring it to the field, you load the sample in and put it in the back of your truck, for example. And it will run, I believe, 40 minutes or so to finish the run. The run. So, but it run on battery, and it not the result outcome is not so much different than the standard real-time PCR that you are seeing. And then on the right side, this one is the uh, the quick test that I believe most of us are familiar with this, right? And if you have not seen this one before, you are really lucky, right? <laughs> so this is very much similar like the COVID test that we are running. So on the left, this one is detecting the viral genomic DNA. On the right, this one is detecting the viral antigen, okay? So the question at that time was like, what is the time frame of detection? Meaning that when the pigs exposed to the virus, when in the earliest time you're gonna detect uh, the virus and for how long, right? And then the second, the second um, question we want to ask is that, okay, how it performed when compared to the standard real-time PCR test? Because I believe that's in the one um, USDA approved for, for testing the known um, um, test, that kind of uh, standard. And the other question I was curious at that time, that can we use it for different type of sample other than the whole blood because we do not want to, to bleed the pig. And so we want to test with, like, I call it saliva, but it's more like the oral pharyngeal uh, swab. Okay. So here the experimental design. So we had two groups of five pigs. And we bleed them the first three times, like, uh, three times more um, 
just to use them as a negative control sample before they are infected with the virus. And then we inoculate them with the uh, virus that uh, the strain that circulated in Vietnam on the day back of the day zero. And then we alternate five picks and because we, we try to avoid bleed them for the welfare purposes. We don't want to bleed them every day, so we bleed five today and then the other five tomorrow and we alternate them. I draw here just the blood sample, but we're collecting the blood and the uh, oral uh, swab as well, not just the blood. So we have two types of sample, the whole blood and the uh, hypothesis saliva. And once we have the sample, we right at the animal facility, we perform the antigen test, the quick test, and then we perform the real-time PCR. So now this is real-time uh, done in the, in the facility. And one set of the sample we brought to the lab where we extract the uh, viral genomic DNA and run the two uh, PCR test missing for the confirmation purposes. And here is the data, how it looked like. This is with the whole blood sample. On the left side, you're gonna see the, um, the day by day result, okay? The red color, and I color coded, so red color always the reference uh, in real time PCR. And you see that you can detect in uh, five out of five weeks, starting on day two after inoculation. So the nice thing of this one is because we inoculate them so we know what time we put the virus in. And so from day two, you see five out of five weeks. On day three, four out of five, I don't know, will have a variation uh, in the animal, but like four out of five, and then it maintained so on until about day 10. Now I didn't put the number here, but like starting on about day seven, uh, we see big die. So this is the percentage, 100% mean like however number of samples we test. But uh, at the toward the end of the of the experiment, a few animals die per day, and uh, it not going to be five animals every day. Okay. But the point here is that we can detect in uh, viral genome DNA um, very early, within two days after inoculation. The blue color is the portable PCR. That is also the real-time PCR, but it's portable, and you can bring it to the to the side. So the two day, uh, it have one. It detect four out of five, but starting from day three after inoculation, it is exactly match to the reference PCR test. Okay. So the only difference is that one sample on the day two we didn't detect that. Otherwise, it is uh, similar to the reference. PCR. Now, the green color is the antigen test. We do not see anything on day two. Okay, on day three, we saw like um, two out of five picks, so forty percent of them. On day three, day four, no, on day four, day five, and day six, we see hundred percent of them matching. And then it, uh, the, the detection rate it kind of dropped down. So. Overall, what you see here is that like, the portable PCR performed very much similar to the reference PCR. Whereas the antigen test, like, it has a shorter window of detection because um, we won't see that until uh, four, only between four and six days when we have 100% match with the, with the reference test. So now I just put it here in terms of statistics to see like, the sensitivity and specificity. So in total, I have 42 samples. No, 82 samples, because we have a lot of samples collecting before uh, we inoculate them, so we have total 82 samples. For the reference test, it says that 41 of them are positive for the virus. Out of 41, the portable PCR detecting 40, so it failed to detect one sample with this line on the, on the, uh, the two. And so in that sense, like, the sensitivity is 97.6%, which is like the simple math there. In terms of specificity for the experimental sample, it's uh, 100 percent, meaning that if it's negative, it is it negative. Okay. For the um, antigen test, again we have 82 samples in total, and uh, the reference test says that there are 41 of them positive. The antigen test detecting only 27 of them because it failed to detect early, and it also like, failed to detect later after the infection. For example, on day two, it didn't detect any of the five samples. And on day three, it detected only the two out of five samples. And for that reason, the sensitivity is lower, only 65.9%. And the specificity is 100%, because if it's negative, it is really negative. So that is the performance with the uh, blood sample. 
And here is the performance with the saliva or the oral pharyngeal swab sample. You see a little bit different, right? With the blood sample on day two, you only see like all of the animal tested positive. But here you wait until day four for the reference test to detect the own five animals. The picture is quite similar with the portable um, PCR. You see very much like matching, except for one sample on day five, and where I have five out of five uh, sample test positive by the reference, but only four out of five test positive by the portable. Other than that day, uh, the rest of them are matching. For the antigen test, you see much lower detection rate. Okay, now. This is a cause because in the instruction of the company, they do not recommend you to use with the saliva test. Okay. This is just my curiosity. I just want to see whether uh, we can use it or not for the shape of like, uh, convenience in terms of collection. So the company do, does not uh, recommend this one. So for the antigen test, it's kind of sporadic. Like someday you detect, someday you are not. It, it's not reliable detection. So in terms of sensitivity and specificity, like uh, the portable PCR performs with the saliva or like the oral uh, swab sample is quite similar to the blood sample. It has 96.9% 96 sensitivity. In both cases, the, sens the specificity is always 100%, meaning that if it's negative, the kid will tell you negative. And then the, the last one for this type of study, I just want to show you the CT value when we compare between the reference test and the portable PCR. So on the left side, that is the whole blood sample, right? We can detect in all of the animal from day two after infection. But you see that it has very high CT value, meaning that the viral load in the blood at that day are, uh, was low. And starting on day three, you see that the CT value reduced, meaning that the viral load is increasing. And my day four, it's it kind of flat, it's it kind of uh, consistent. And so you see quite similar trend. We cannot compare the absolute value between the two tests, right? The CT value of two tests are depend on like, how we design it. Not, we not compare the number to number, but you see the trend they are similar. Uh, in the case of the reference test, which is the red, uh, red color here. It, it said that high CP at day two, and then the portable test also said high CP at day two. It's quite, quite near the image from each other. And you want to see quite similar in terms of the saliva sample as well. Okay, So between the portable uh, PCR and the whole blood, I see quite similar trend between them. So here is a uh, quick summary for this part of the talk. So the viral. DNA was detected in the blood and saliva sample from day two and day four after infection, respectively. So you're detecting it in the oral uh, pharyngeal uh, swab a little bit later when compared, about two days later compared to the whole blood. The portable PCR show very comparable detection rate as compared to the reference um, PCR. Test. By the way, I forgot to mention at the beginning, I caught reference, in this case, I used the um, um, the king, you know, the vet max would be the term official uh, PCR product because it sell in Vietnam at that time. I could buy it commercially uh, from, from Vietnam. The rapid antigen test had uh, to me a good detection if you use for the heart level, right? You can detect it still with reliable detection at heart level, but the, it has shorter window of detection. For example, it could not detect early when the viral load are low, right? it needs a, a little bit higher viral load. The rapid antigen test is not appropriate to use with the saliva sample. And again, this is just a curiosity for testing and see whether it works or not. And in this case, it doesn't work. Now I move on to say uh, to uh, to present a little bit about the work that is funded by USDA. This one is more like, um, basic um, science work than the previous one. So what we <coughs> what we like to do in this one is that we just simply compare the antibody response in pig that received the live attenuated vaccine and the inactivated vaccine. Very simple compare the immune response between the two of them and why so. Here's how we, we make the conventional vaccine right. When there is 
And now Breca went to East, the new disease, we went to the farm, or we went to the diagnostic lab, we pick up the clinical sample. What we try to do is that we grow the virus up. And when you grow it up, you have two options. One is that to kill it, to use it as inactivated vaccine. The other one is you have to attenuate it one way or another, to use it as a live attenuated vaccine. So for ASF particularly, we know that the inactivated vaccine doesn't work. Okay, when you immunize the animal with the inactivated vaccine, there is no protection, and several food have reported that. On the other hand, you're going to find that a lot of literature, they are different group and they need different way to attenuated virus, but the general sense is that the live attenuated virus confer protection, at least against the homologous virus, okay? And many papers show 100% um, protection. So that they are the clear difference between the two vaccines. And my interest in why, right? why one vaccine protect and the other is not protect. And here is just the two person that I like to put their picture here because they have been published by uh, many paper in terms of developing life of the vaccine and particularly two of their vaccines are licensed to be used in Vietnam and kind of the first ASF life attenuated vaccine are approved in Vietnam. That's why I use them here. What of the risks associated with the live attenuated vaccine? And this is not just the ASF vaccine, but in general, like live attenuated vaccine uh, in general, is that the virus may revert to virulence, right, and causing trouble. Again, this is not special for ASF only, but in general for live attenuated uh, virus, because the, vi the live vi virus vaccine still replicate in the animal, and when it replicates, it has a chance to, to gain uh, a um, virulence. For the ASF, like the, uh, the live attenuated vaccine lack the differentiate uh, infected from vaccinated animal uh, capacity, meaning that like, once you use the live vaccine, you cannot use the ELISA or the serological test to say whether your animal or infected animal. Because at that time, the animal will have ELISA positive because of vaccination. And so for that reason, like, if you use the live attenuated vaccine, then the, it's very difficult to do a serological test for um, diagnosis. So that are the kind of limitation of the live attenuated vaccine. The subunit vaccine, by definition, is the vaccine that have only one or a few viral antigen that can induce protective immunity. You can use different forms, but by de definition, it, Subunit vaccine just contain a few viral protein, one or a few that can induce protection. Compared to the live attenuated vaccine, the subunit vaccine are safer, right? And it's compatible with the DVA because you use only a few viral antigen to make the vaccine. Whichever you do not put into the vaccine vial, you can use it at the uh, cell diagnosis. Another thing that I want to call your attention, like I said before, that ASF is the agent that is very hard to work with because in the US there are only a few places are allowed to work with them. Right now there are many vaccine candidates, but I believe like they can only be uh, handled in a few facilities. You cannot just simply like, make the vaccine for them, right? The other limitation of the ASF is that it grows in the uh, primary macrophage. It doesn't have the good cell line. Although there are a few publications saying that they have a cell line for that, but in general, like if you read the literature, you say that you see that they use the, the primary cell line, so it's a limitation. With the, with the subunit vaccine, you can eliminate all of those um, issues. So why don't people make the subunit vaccine for that? The answer is very simple. We do not know which one we put into the vaccine bottle. That is just simple like that, right? For the COVID, like every vaccine company use the spike protein. Doesn't matter what platform, but every of them use the spike protein because you know that is the one that induces protection. But for ASF, we don't know. Right? I don't know if there is one single protein of ASF gonna do the job. Okay. So my interest is that I want to identify the potential viral protein that I can put into the vaccine bottle. And so how do I do that? Like I said at the very beginning, right, the live attenuated vaccine induced protection. The inactivated vaccine does not. So I have two groups of animals. One group I vaccinate that with in inactivated vaccine. The other group I vaccinate with the live attenuated vaccine. I take the blood sample and then I measure the antibody response against each 
in the video built in of the ASA. Okay, and once I do that, like, I have a panel of antibody response again when we immunize with the light attendant of the vaccine, and I have another panel of antibody response with the inactivated vaccine, and I compare between them to see what is the difference. And when I have a difference, and my hypothesis is that the viral protein that induces immune response in the live attenuated, but not in the inactivated, potentially is the candidate that I should look at. So that is my hypothesis. And so in order to do that, I need the live attenuated vaccine, right? I don't have any live attenuated vaccine, and the one that uh, people are producing would not when you ask them to get no skin, right? Mm -hmm. If they have the live attenuated vaccine, then it's very hard to convince them to share with you to use. So luckily, at, um, my collaborator in Vietnam, uh, he developed a live attenuated vaccine. And this is um, the preprint, so you can read about this one. It's not my product, and I won't, I won't not talk much about that one, but he shared the uh, vaccine with me so that I can use in my study. So here are the data. I have three groups of pigs, what, and uh, each group had 10 pigs. One group, I do not do anything, I call it no vaccination, or NV, not in control group. The second group, I vaccinate with the Q vaccine, the KV. And the third group, I vaccinate with the live attenuated vaccine, and the one that I showed you in the paper in the previous slide. So after vaccination, I just collecting the blood sample to, to check for viremia. Because in this case, you see that you can detect in the viral genome with DNA only in the group that received the live attenuated vaccine. The only, the only thing is that like only three out of 10 animals are viremic, was viremic. It is a little bit different than the literature that you see because in other papers, like all of the vaccinated animals become viremic with the life of animal vaccine. In this particular case, only three out of 10 animals, okay? And here are the antibodies based on the P72, which is the capsid protein, and this is the commercial ELISA that I can buy, okay? And this is, you see that the, the red line in the kill vaccine and then the green line in the live attenuated vaccine by day 41 after vaccination you don't see the difference between them okay so now if you just use the commercial ELISA and you look at antibody you see that they are the same live attenuated vaccine or inactivated vaccine they just do similar but one protecting the other is not that means that if you just use the commercial ELISA you cannot understand why one vaccine protect and the other is not that is the reason why I want to look for different uh, candidate protein that allow me to see the difference between them. Now, the protection outcome. So on the left is the survival rate. So we challenge them on day 32, day 42, sorry. And then we just monitor them uh, for 21 days. The green line here is the group that received the live attendance of the vaccine. All of 10 animals survive, 10 out of 10. And then the other two groups that do have only like 20% um, of 30% survival. So we like to use what we call the lethal dose, and the dose that my collaborator had been used before it killed 100% of animals. But in this particular case, it didn't happen that way. So I still have a few animal survivors. What you can see in the clear difference in terms of protection outcome between the um, live attenuated vaccine and the inactivated vaccine. On the right side is the viremia. Okay, we breed the animal uh, every three, four days, so twice a week to measure, uh, to measure viremia. So the group that no vaccination, we have very high viremia type. And similar is the, um, the Q vaccine group, okay? The group that received the live attenuated vaccine have kind of two uh, profiles. There are four animals that have high viremia, and six animals have very low viremia, okay? But they all survive. So now I move to the next part. This is the this is the, the core part of my study. I want to measure antibody response or antibody against each individual protein of ASF, and there are about like 200 different proteins, right? In order to do that, like I use the um, ASA we call the luciferase immunoprecipitation system. This one is developed by a person at the NIH um, for human. Uh, um, uh, medicine and I adopted this technology. So what we do is that like, we have a plasmid that have luciferase in there and luciferase is an enzyme when it to go to the substrate it will um, um, make light and you can measure the light in it. 
and then I clone each individual genes of ASL3 into that plasmid. And when I transfect to the cell, I will produce the fusion protein. It has one part is the ASL3, and the other part is the luciferase. Basically, I make, uh, for now, I make 68 different proteins. Those are the structural protein of the virus. And in the future, I make every single protein of that. But the idea is that all 68 of them have a common luciferase, right? But they have different in the ASF part. So when you incubate that, each individual protein with the, um, with the um, sera from the animal, if the animal had antibody against the ASF lead part, they will bind to that, right? And you can do that in the uh, 96 well plate, and you do duplicate, meaning that, like, and with a few other controls, meaning that one 96 well plate, you can measure about 40, 40, 40 different antigen, okay? So now you incubate your sera with the protein. If the sera contain antibody against the AF, ASFV part, it will bind to that. And then you put the bead into that, the cephalo bead, so that you can retain the complex, the antigen antibody complex in the well. If the sera doesn't contain the antibody, then your fusion protein will be washed away during the wash step. And then you add the substrate in, and if there is antibody, antibody will bind to the protein, and then protein will react to the substrate and make light. And so you quantify the light unit and the, the higher the signal, that means that the higher antibody concentration we have in the sample. The advantage of this one is that I can use the crew protein. I don't have to purify protein. For ELISA, you have to purify it. For this one, you don't. You just make the cloning, transfect into the cell, and get the protein lysate, and you can do the assay. For this particular project, I use 68 structural protein. I assembly has 68 different structural protein. I clone 68 of them successfully, but I could do only uh, put to use only 64 protein because the other one didn't express very well. And then I measure antibody and uh, respond against 64 different protein. And here are the overview of the um, uh, antibody reactivity. Okay. So this is a very simple heat map just to give you the visualization. So each of the row is the antibody uh, reactivity against the protein. And the protein name is very small here, you cannot read that. But basically one row is antibody binding to one viral protein. One column is one serum sample. What you could see in here that I, uh, on the left side here with the green label, those are the sera from the live attenuated vaccine. In the middle here, which is the kind of pink colors, those are the sera come from the inactivated vaccine. And on the left side, those are the sera come from the uh, control, ten control animal, okay? There are a few exceptions, but in general, they, the sera group together based on the pattern that is bind to the antigen. Now, I want to see which one is the immunogenic. The other one just give you an overview, and I define immunogenic protein as the one that is recognized by the vaccinated sample, at least like fourfold higher than the control sera. So that's in my definition of the immunogenic one. In this case, the live attenuated vaccine has 16, react to 16 different proteins, or like we have 16 out of 29 samples. Just a few reasons, I include quite a few uh, proteins now, but out of 29 samples uh, analyzed, uh, I, the live attenuated vaccine react to 16 of them. The inactivated vaccine react to only three of them. And one of them is the P32. And by the way, P32 is the antigen that many people use to develop the ELISA. And that's why there's no surprise when you use that to test the, the live attenuated vaccine or the inactivated vaccine animal both react to that one. The last one I do is that I just want to see if there is any correlation in terms of antibody intensity and the viral load after the challenge, right? So, the y-axis here is the antibody intensity, and then the x-axis here is the, the viral load after vaccination. And this one we use, the, we call area under the curve, which is the cumulative viral load throughout 21 day. And I found five, five different proteins where you see quite nice uh, negative correlation, meaning that when you have more antibody against those five proteins, you have less viral load. 
What does it mean? I don't know yet. Whether they are the candidate or not, that we need to validate them. But this is the, uh, the observation that um, we have five, uh, five uh, protein where you have the negative correlation between the antibody type and the viral load. So in summary, what I showed you today is that the live attendant with the vaccine confers solid protection. And this is not my uh, own statement because you can find uh, many different papers already to show this one. Live attendant with the vaccinated pigs develop antibody against a broader array of protein compared to the inactivated vaccine. And we observe a negative correlation between the antibody titer and the viral load after protection, after channel infection. Now the last piece of, uh, of uh, data, I have just two more slides to show you. What do I do next with this, right? Like I said, the ASF, we have about like 150, 200 different protein. Today, I just showed you data from 29 proteins. Even though I measure antibody binding to 64, I have to eliminate many of them because of different reasons. But uh, I will continue doing this type of activity. Hopefully, I find a list, a shorter list of the candidate uh, for the next step. And then the next step will be like I make the kind of subunit vaccine based on the candidate that I find and then see whether they confer any protection or not. In terms of subunit vaccine, here how I see it. Once you identify the candidate, you have kind of four different options. One option is that you can use the protein expression system like the Bacolovirus system, like the E. coli system. You produce the protein, right? When you produce the protein, you mix with activant and you use them to inject them to the animal. The other option you could do is that if you clone your gene in the DNA plasmid and you inject the animal with that DNA plasmid, it's more like the DNA based vaccine. Or from the gene that you have, you make the messenger RNA and then you use that as the messenger RNA vaccine, like the COVID vaccine that we are talking about. The last option is that if you clone the gene that you identify into the viral vector and use the viral vector to deliver that, either way that you need to know what gene you should do, right? That is the key part. So what I show you uh, is the data that I have with this one, the DNA-based vaccine. So DNA has been used, DNA vaccine has been used in animal, in human for many years, right? We know that it works, but like, the immunogenicity is very low. If you inject the animal with the naked plasmid, the plasmid do not come to the animal cell effectively. And if the plasmid doesn't enter the cell, it do nothing. The plasmid cannot induce immune response, cannot induce antibody response. The messenger RNA cannot induce antibody response. Messenger RNA or the plasmid have to go into the cell, become the protein. The protein is the one that induces the antibody response. So for that reason, like one of the area of research you have to do is to find a way to make the plasmid to enter the animal cell. You have to find a way to make the messenger on the molecule to enter the animal cell. If they don't enter the cell, they do nothing. They cannot induce that body response. So the area that many people are doing is that they wrap around the messenger RNA or they wrap around the DNA plasmid with what we call the lipid nanoparticle just to facilitate the uptake of that uh, antigen. And so that's what I did, and then I make a very quick trial here. I had two groups of animals, and each group only three animals. In group one, I induced, I, I inoculated with 100 microgram of uh, plasmid DNA. The second group, I inoculated with 500 microgram of plasmid DNA, and the third group is just for control purposes. And I treat the animal um, every uh, a few days and simply measure the antibody response because I cannot do any challenge yet with, uh, with this study. I don't have that luxury yet. And here is that what you see. Like for the group that received 500 micrograms, you see very high antibody titer after 26 days. By the way, I use only one dose of vaccination. If you read the literature, and when you do with the DNA vaccine, it needs multiple doses because DNA in general has very low immunogenicity. In our case, we checked in only one single dose of the plasmid DNA, and we saw very high antibody response um, in, the, in the animal with uh, the dose of 500 micrograms. I didn't show the data here, but if I, I give a booster shot, the group that received 100 micrograms of uh, plasmid also made the antibody response as well. But it did a booster shot, shot. And with that, I think I, I don't think I have time, right? Yeah. So, 
acknowledge my like this book it, most of the work I show here is done in collaboration with them. Uh, in particular with uh, these two uh, individuals at the Vietnam National University of Agriculture. And I am so fortunate to receive the funding from the Swipe Health Information Center, the National Pop Ball and the USDA. Thank you for your attention. That's a very nice work, a very nice presentation. Back to your uh, diagnostic comparisons, can you describe a little bit what clinical signs you were seeing when you were first detecting in the blood and then describe the more, uh, more extensively how you took the oral swabs? Was it swabs, not oral fluids? So, <clears throat> The animal um, uh, have like very clear uh, classical sign of um, uh, ASFV infection, and I, I don't have the the, um, the graph here, but like, they started to have fever maybe by day three or day also, and then like uh, by day seven, like uh, we start seeing the pig die, and day ten, like we have the euthanasia. And uh, when you uh, when we use an IV, do the necropsy. I didn't do that actually. Like I didn't uh, perform any of those work, but the collaborator did that, and they took a picture, and you saw extensive hemorrhagic, very classical, um, ASF uh, blood sign, but um, fever and off feet like about day four, so that they don't eat because they have fever, and uh, we sometimes euthanize them for the uh, uh, welfare purposes as well because at that point. It, we cannot keep the animal longer. Um, then the oral uh, swap, we use the um, kind of, um, how would you call that, the, the cotton um, uh, gout, and then we, we put into the, the cheek of the animal to absorb the saliva from there. So that's why we call it uh, more like the buckle swap. And then after you swap, and we put it into the syringe, and then we rest so that the, the juice will come out from that, uh, from that gout. So in that cell, you will pick up some, some cell from the muckle as well. So I caught saliva, but I, I think it's not an appropriate uh, description either, but it's more like the oral uh, swab. Do we have one more question, burning question? Nice presentation. Uh, despite the fact there are a long previous number of animals were uh, were vaccinated, did you see any side effect in the vaccinated animals? So for our live attenuated vaccine, again, I didn't do the work, right? I, I, I took a secret report and basically there are no side effect. This live attenuated vaccine particularly is more attenuated than the other one that you see in the literature because only three out and animal vitamin. If you read the paper from the Plum Island group, they said that like, the, for the live attenuated vaccine to work, it had to become vitamin. It had to be able to replicate in the animal. And whenever they delete the genes from the viral genome and the virus cannot replicate in the animal, then there is no protection. And that's what they, they report in the paper. In our case here, like, we see that only three out seven, uh, three out ten animals had a detectable vitamin. But they still survive the infection. And uh, after vaccination, again, no side effect. After challenge, like, um, I need to look at the um, fever data, but like, uh, the bottom line that they all survive, and I don't think they had like, very prolonged fever after challenge. Quick question What was the brand of the rapid testing for ASF? And the same for the portable PCR. What was the brand, <coughs> commercial brand? You mean the brand of the rapid test and oh, the portable PCR? The, um, the rapid uh, antigen test is from the um, Ingeda Sire Group from Spain, and the uh, portable PCR is the Tetra Call Quick question mm -hmm. Are there portable system, mm -hmm. did you have to extract DNA? No. In this case, no extraction, so I used directly, I didn't show you the data, but like we do compare with the extraction and basically the data, it matching. The reason why I didn't show the extraction data, because I don't need to show that. You see that without extraction, it performed quite well, and so there are no reason to show that data. Okay, so, sorry, I'm gonna have to, otherwise you're not gonna eat.
Thank you. 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 Thank you.